in the first place I want to thank you that you make it able for me to talk to a man who e inspired many people. Oh, among, okay. Um, among which my own band back in 89. Okay. Oh, you're welcome. So, it's, not, it's not a big deal. <laughs> <sighs> well, for me it is because oh, thank you, you're, in other words, kind of like a legend in my book. Ah, thank you. And so I would love to start with the unavoidable first question. Okay. Could you introduce yourself okay. to the readers of the website fuck.nl? F-O-K. F-O-K. Yeah. Hey, welcome to F-O-K. Fuck. The website. I'm Tommy Victor, guitar player, singer for Prong. I heard you have another bass player with you tonight on this tour. Where is Jason? Jason, I mean, you know, we had uh, a couple of problems with him, but he's had some money problems, and uh, he's got a young child, so uh, he decided not to come on the tour. So he needs to get his life in order. And who is replacing him tonight? Well, Mike has been with Prong before. He said he was at the Power of the Damager tour, and he's been around for a long time. Longworth, so... Ah, Mike Longworth. Isn't yeah. he also the guy who played on the... Track Revenge, best. Yeah, he song. wrote that song with me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was reading about your band, of course, when I was uh, writing the questions for it, and I found out that before Prong, you worked as a soundman at CBGBs. Was it there that you got inspired to form your own band? Oh, uh, I was working at CBGBs, the sound man, and Mike Kirkland was the doorman and um, he actually approached me on forming another band and doing it and I, he had a girlfriend that knew me from Queens and said, oh, you play, right? And I'm like, yeah, I, at that point I was, wasn't was really interested in putting a band together. But uh, he got me inspired to do it and you know, from working there, I was exposed to so much music, so many different bands, so uh, I was in the scene and was able to pick and choose the styles I liked, and Mike as well, and uh, I knew Ted from Swans, wow. and uh, he wanted to do more like thrash metal and like hardcore and more aggressive music, I mean, a little different than Swans, so we just uh, all had similar interests, similar bands that we liked, and uh, we put it together fairly quickly. I got instantly inspired again, I had a lot of... Uh, bad experiences with bands before that, and uh, so I was a little disenchanted. But uh, and I never played guitar in a band before neither. So uh, when we initially started, we were like, "Oh, who's going to play what?" And uh, I played bass ma mainly in groups, and uh, Mike was like, "Oh, you you could play guitar." So that's, I sort of well, I, I had an inspired to play guitar and just sat around with a couple of records and sort of learned on the job really. Uh, when you look back at those years, can you name a few of the bands that inspired you? Well, there's a lot of them. I mean, as far as the hardcore bands, there's bands that, that really didn't get that popular, like Rest in Pieces, I liked a lot. Uh, there, there was other hardcore bands that I thought were were great, like Leeway. Uh, and then uh, it, it's, there was just so many other groups that, that were around. There's a band Rat At, Rat R that I really liked a lot. and. Uh, and then, you know, we, we were, I got involved in tape trading and, and, and uh, there was other bands that I started getting exposed to. Uh, and uh, I was into a lot of the British music, like the goth stuff and uh, like, you know, like, like Bauhaus and uh, Specimen. And I mean, Killing Joke has always been one of my favorite bands. And yeah. And, uh, but we're at back to CBs. I mean, I, you know, I, well, a, a good friend of mine was Vernon Reed from Living Color. And uh, he helped the band out a lot. And I really liked them a lot. And I liked the Bad Brains and 24-7 uh, Spies. And uh, just a lot, of, a lot of different kinds of stuff rather than just straight hardcore, too. And in metal, I mean, it was a band Whiplash I really liked. And then uh, we had a, an early... Uh, uh, combat shows like with combat record shows at CBs and 
you had like Possessed came through there and Dark Angel and I, I, I got wow. crazy about wow. Dark Angel and uh, so it was just a big fusion and then I was like oh you know Prong is just a fusion of all these styles a lot of different styles how long did you work at TBG before? For four you? years, from 86 to 90. Oh, the golden years. Yeah, I mean, well, before that, it was, I think, a little bit... The golden years were always from, I think, from, like, 1977 to, like, 90. By the time 90 came around, it was starting to get weak to me. And I was, like, I was sort of dreading going to work. I mean, it was it's just things changed a lot. Okay. In that case, I was thinking, last year you made an album called Songs from the Black Hole. And one of the songs on it is a song by Huska Du. Right. That surprised me a bit. Well, I mean, I, I mean, as far as, as guitar players go, I really like Bob Moles playing a lot. I mean, that was an early influence too. Like, you know, the Everything Falls Apart record. Um, that was more I, what I wanted to do as a cover, but uh, uh, but we did uh, Don't Want to Know If You Were Lonely instead because it was more recognizable. We were trying to do a little bit more recognizable songs, but I mean, we, we, I, we centered on selecting songs that like influenced prong or me guitar wise and vocally okay uh i was checking out some current set lists of your uh, tour and i noticed that there aren't any songs of the first two albums and even one song from back to differ and from uh, uh the other one prove you wrong well, we have a short can, set on this tour. I mean, we're, we're supporting other bands, so, uh, you know, we can't, we had to be selective. And, you know, we have new records out, so, you know, we want to have, represent the new prong. Yeah. As well as, you know, as much as we can from the other ones. I mean, in, in a 40 minute set, there's very, you know, we have, there's not much we can do. Okay, I was I was afraid but, but you were getting record, tired of the older stuff or something. No, I mean from back to differ on, I like playing all that stuff. The old from Primitive Origins and Force Fed, uh, not many people are familiar with those records. I mean, you apparently are, but uh, they're not recognizable as much. So uh, we choose not to play them. But I mean, inevitably on the. Uh, the 30th anniversary of our first appearance in Europe, uh, we're probably going to reintroduce those songs. So we're waiting, I mean, uh, until the right moment and uh, maybe re-release those records somewhere down the line. Oh, Not I many people are familiar with those records. No, they, but they should, I think, because they are an, a, an important part. Maybe, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a, you know, much of a rock historian that much, but uh, yeah, I mean, they had, they had its place in time. They shape the sound of the band in a, in a way. Yeah. Even when I listen to the new record, I still hear some elements that come from. Yeah, the I mean, it's because of my playing. I mean, where I come from. I mean, it's, it's going to span any prong release. Is going to have that in there, and, you know. But you're right. I mean, like you know, like the stuff on on no absolutes, that may be a, a tip of the hat, so to speak, or or uh, a reference to force fed, a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's all part of the whole mesh of stuff that Prong has done with material. Talking about X, X slash no absolutes. Am I correct when I say it's lyric-wise a more personal album than the previous releases? No, not really. I, it, it's, there hasn't really that been that many drastic changes in, in the lyrical content with Prong. Uh, so... Uh, uh, it may appear that way, but it's, it's it gets a little political and personal. Uh, to me, it's very similar to Beg to Differ style uh, lyrically, but uh, nothing's really that changed that much. I don't think. Okay. I mean, I mean, unless I I growing as a person or whatever, so it reflects it with the lyrics. I mean, I, I spend a lot of time on the lyrics, and you know, I really try to get them where uh, I'm satisfied. Uh, and I, I'm very happy with the lyrics on, on 10 No Absolutes. I think, you know, in, in certain instances on earlier records, I would be rushing the, the, a lot of the lyrics and they didn't have any reference points that much, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly pleased with the lyrics on that record more than any other record, I think. That's always good to hear. Sorry? That's always good to hear. Yeah, no, I'm really happy. I mean, that whole record, Prong 10 No Absolutes, I mean, I... I uh, but when we finished it, I was like, well, this, I, I really firmly believe that 
that was like the best prom record ever done. I mean, the way it went, how 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 uh, free and easy, and and well, we worked very hard, but it, it was uh, uh, it just there wasn't that many disagreements. It flowed really easily. Uh, you know, the lyrics came to me. Uh, you know, I had great people working on the record. Where in other instances, I've said it in other interviews, it was just you go in to make a record and then there's problems with the studio. Then you know, one of the guys is is having problems. Then you know, uh, the, I'm not getting, I'm not agreeing with the producer or the engineer or, or what have you. There was always, uh, apart from Bake to Differ and Cleansings, there was other records that we had a lot of problems with. And that one, No Absolutes, was an easy. Uh, you know, Chris was amazing working with and I'm continually working with Chris Collier I mean, he's just a, a, he's amazing and you know we have a, a system there's no fooling around we get in there and do it and it's just uh, it's a pleasurable experience and have a lot of fun well it's not fun uh, it's just work and it's just it's getting it done and without you know without uh, uh, egos and disagreements too much mm -hmm. I was wondering about the last album. Is there a deeper meaning behind that title? There's a lot of things that get involved with that. That it's this with that title. Um, you know, there's two thoughts. Uh, people say there are there are a certain absolutes, and uh, there are certain conditions. And then there's another school say that there aren't any absolutes. That it's just all chaos. Um, uh, the, the 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 album cover really reflects really what what it's about. Which uh, uh, there's there's people that will say that there's no absolutes, uh, and really there are absolutes that need to be uh, implemented in order to, to create to in order to prevent utter chaos from happening. Okay. Which seems to be where everything is going. So, you know, I mean, uh, I'm not, I'm not, uh, uh, I don't see Armageddon happening or anything. But uh, you know, there's certain there's, there's certain moral codes that need to be uh, there's ethics and moral codes that need to be implemented in society in order for things to be to work proficiently and. Uh, there's a definite movement where people, where it's like, well, there's no, there's, there are no laws or there are no uh, rules, therefore, you know, anarchy will take place. So that's really, it's a food for thought. I, I really don't take that many positions. I'm a very wavering type of person. Like, I'll go back and forth and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll see what, what's going on. And I change continually with my views on everything. Uh, at that point in time, uh, uh, the lyric for, for the song, No Absolutes, is more about it, like you were saying earlier, it's a more personal thing where it's, uh, you know, I'm willing to, you know, a lot of people don't want to really reject change, and uh, that's what that song's about, where, uh, you know, you, the, the only change that you could possibly have is, is somewhere inside you in reflection of the universe, and therefore... Uh, creating your you know, your perception of things, but uh, the outside forces that try to dictate that uh, will tell you don't change, you know, stay where you are, and and uh, that's basically what that song's about. So that definitely reflects into the global experience that seem to be that that is reflected in the album cover, which just shows uh, you know. Uh, doom or whatever but uh, it's uh, I mean that goes to your personal life too if you're not willing to to continue with your ethics but you know willing to change then uh, the, you may have some problems yep in a way there's only one thing absolute in life and that's that Death. a person dies yes and taxes <laughs> uh, I found out that today will be your 42nd concert in the Netherlands Wow, I, I wouldn't even know. That's a lot of shows. Did you know that according to the Hitchhiker's Guide of the Galaxy, yeah. 42 is the ultimate number and the ultimate question about of the uh, answer to the question about life, 
the universe and everything else. I never knew that. I mean, I've always been obsessed with the number 23. Uh, not obsessed, but uh, curious about it because Crowley was so into 23 all the time and it, it, he had all this basis of it within uh, Masonic uh, thought. Uh, so I never heard that before. So that's interesting. Yeah. Was that like Thomas Wolfe is, you know, involved with it, right? So, or, yeah, it's, I'd be 42. I don't know. I have to look that up. Uh, I once heard about a project called Teenage Time Killers, which was like an epic supergroup, an unbelievable supergroup, and see how many people joined in. Uh -huh. I was wondering why was it that that didn't get that much uh, It's a good question. I, uh, I have a theory behind that, uh, and it's it's in line with the way things are moving, which is. Uh, there's a, a lack of respect for innovators and uh, people that have taken chances. Uh, I think that as we go along, especially in art, those people will be more and more disrespected because uh, they're seen as ones that are not looking at, at the big picture or social improvement or something like that. So, you know, uh, you know, the Lemmys and the Ozzy Osbournes and, you know, the Bowies and, and uh, the Tony Iommi's or whatever you want to say, the Richie Blackmore's and the, the, uh, you know, the Lou Reed's, that, that whole era of these iconic uh, types is dead, really, and, and is disrespected and the general consensus, with, especially in the music world, is just conformity. And uh, when you have like the Lee Ving and you know Corey Taylor and all these icons together, people don't really care. They don't. They want a brand, and they want uh, a, a they they want McDonald's and fast food, and they they don't they don't care about the individuals that made these things happen or anything anymore. It's like it's a dead thing. You know, like the young kids today, that they, they like, you know, the, these uh, uh, DJs, they don't even know their names and they don't really care. And these faceless, uh, that's why it's definitely faceless, really, with, uh, you know, Daft Pop, da, da, you know, the Daft Punk movement, which, which is just the identities are stripped away from, from music and it's just this global, there's nothing wrong with that, mm -hmm. but they're, they're definitely uh, uh, imposing their... Uh, uh, mass will upon the music business. Yeah. Uh, when you look back on 30 years of prom, because if I'm, cor I'm correct, it was 30 years ago that the band was formed, 1986. Something like that. Yeah, it was. <laughs> what do you consider the highlights of all those years? Which well, I'm, I'm a very moment, I mean, I, I've learned, I live in the moment, and like, uh, you know, obviously I, I get you know, questioned about the past a lot and blah, blah, blah. To me, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't, it's, it's irrelevant to my life that much. Like, like, you know, like today is the, this is the most momentary and most important thing to me. Like last night or, you know, okay. like, uh, uh, I'm not a historian of my own career. I don't recall the shows. Uh, I don't save laminates and, you know, uh, day sheets from last previous tours. Uh, I don't know if I've, how many times I've played, you know, Den Hog or, you know, uh, any place. Just somebody goes, oh, you played Den Bosch 20 years ago. And I was like, I don't know, you know. So uh, it's uh, uh, the most momentary thing is releasing Prong 10 No Absolutes and, you know, touring for that and, you know, just uh, living for today, really. I mean, I don't uh, see any reason to bask in any previous successes or failures, really. Okay. In that case, uh, one more question about the past. Okay. <laughs> if, if you uh, look back, would you have expected to be in the same bed after so many years? I think internally my will was that, 
and I don't know where that will came from, but uh, somewhere that along the line, uh, I realized, based upon previous experiences in other bands and other uh, other projects, that uh, I needed to take care of myself, which was like I needed to write lyrics, I needed to play guitar, I needed to have otherwise I would not survive in the music business. So and I needed to know like engineering. And uh, I needed to read books and, uh, uh, you know, I, ha I had to do certain things in order to uh, survive. So uh, I guess that will, wherever that came from, out of just uh, ambition or selfishness or what ha however you want to interpret it, enabled my career to last this long. So... Uh, you know, that it's just my makeup. I, I don't know where it's from or, uh, you know, who's who's telling me what to do, but it's it's like an outside source and then an internal source that comes from wherever. I, don't, I have no idea. Okay. I got a final question that is, is there anything you want to say to the, to the people of Fuck.nl who are looking at this interview right now? Well, I'm going to be a marketer in here and say, you know, like, check out our, our recent releases. I don't think you'd be disappointed. Anybody that's heard Prong 10 Absolutes, I go out to the merch booth after the show. And people are like, wow, you know, you know, like, you continue to make good records and uh, that's formidable. So, uh, you know, uh, if you haven't heard it, if you have Spotify, you know, check out the new songs. And then uh, come see us because we play the old ones too. Regardless of what you said, we do cover cleansing material, and you know we do play. Represent, unconditional. Play to, yes, we play unconditional every night. And then um, you know the we try to represent it. And on our soul, on our, our headlining shows, we do more. You know, like from Carved to the Stone and other records as well. More Rooting Lives and Root Awakening as well. So yeah, thank you for the support. Uh, it's always great to be in Holland, it's a wonderful country, and we love it here. And uh, It's our first time in uh, Leuwarden, Leuwarden. Yeah. Uh, interesting uh, place, very nice. Thank you. Thank you.